Hi, I'm Gavin Giovanoni. I'm Professor of Neurology from Barts and the London School of Medicine and Dentistry. And I'd like to thank the RIMS organization for asking me to talk to you about COVID-19 and the impact it's had on rehabilitation in the MS space. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures, which may be relevant to this uh, meeting. I'd just like to start off by talking to you about some of the uh, issues that have arisen during the pandemic, particularly the sad fact that we've passed uh, 5 million deaths, and this is a massive underestimate. If you follow the Economist's online data portal, it's probably uh, close to 16 or 17 million uh, at the moment. Tragically, it's had a massive impact on healthcare professionals, and the WHO predicts that at least 180,000 people who work in the medical profession have died from uh, COVID-19. Uh, this is a wall of remembrance that went up by the British Medical Association early on in the pandemic, uh, highlighting uh, doctors that had died as a result of uh, COVID-19. And I want to put up uh, a slide of remembrance for Dr. Peter Tan. Uh, some of you may remember him. He was a, a rehabilitation uh, expert working in the Royal Berkshire Hospital. And he died on the 13th of April, the day after my birthday, as a result of complications of COVID-19. Uh, he was an incredibly generous, friendly colleague, uh, and we will miss him. Uh, he tragically raised the issue of not having PPE, and there is a national inquiry happening into the NHS handling of the pandemic, and hopefully uh, something will happen uh, in his name, so his death hasn't been in vain. But I want to point out, if you look at the nationality or the ethnicity of the people who died during the early part of the pandemic, you can see majority of these people are from ethnic and minority backgrounds, and uh, this raises a uh, a sad fact that a lot of uh, outcomes in the uh, COVID-19 pandemic have been due to social determinants of health or other factors, uh, and there are some genomic factors that may also contribute to the high mortality uh, amongst uh, ethnic minority doctors in the UK. We had a massive uh, impact on services. So this is the hospital I work at. It's the Royal London Hospital in Whitechapel. Um, it's 15 floors, and I just want to point out um, that at the height of the second pandemic, 12 of the 15 floors were dedicated to managing COVID-19. You know, at the um, at the peak uh, of the pandemic, we had 172 patients uh, on ventilators. And that's on a, a background of around about 50 to 60 ITU beds. So we had to triple our intensive care unit beds uh, by building new intensive care units uh, during the, the pandemic. The 60 refers to 60%, so our hospital complex is one of uh, five hospitals, four of them are acute hospitals, and at the peak of the uh, pandemic, 60% of all deaths uh, were occurring in our four NHS hospitals. So we, as a um, NHS organisation in London, uh, were seriously impacted by the uh, pandemic. I was redeployed to general medicine, uh, I had to reskill, and I had a three days of shadowing a, another consultant, and I was on the wards running a general medical ward. Uh, we had a seven day on, seven day backup, and seven day off where I had to do my specialty work. Uh, the truth is, I didn't stop doing my specialty work. I was doing it in the in my spare time uh, and fitting in uh, virtual consultations when I could. I did realize that general medicine has changed. It become very subspecialty driven uh, with lots of protocols. So if somebody came in with renal problems, the renal team came to see them, for example. And I think what was quite clear is that once all the subspecialties had removed all the work for me, what was left on our ward was really um, mainly old, older patients with mainly social issues that we had difficulty discharging them. But we also had an acute crisis because a lot of people needed rehab. You know, we were a step down ward from the intensive care unit with quite a lot of really sick ex, you know, COVID-19 patients. Uh, these people were critical illness myopathies, critical illness neuropathies, and there was a massive shortage of uh, rehab beds so we could discharge them for rehabilitation. So I realized that, you know, in future pandemics or future crises like this, they have to think about having a 
system for uh, discharge into the community where active rehabilitation could occur. Maybe not in a rehab unit, but in a setting where rehab could be delivered, maybe in the home environment. I must point out from this US study, which looked at the impact of COVID-19 on people with multiple sclerosis uh, issues, you can see on this y-axis it goes from one, which is low impact, to seven, high impact. And what's looking at uh, a survey across various domains is that the pandemic had a massive impact on patients' uh, quality of life uh, across multiple domains. And I think that's the message to take home. Uh, people with chronic disease, not just MS, uh, had a really, really tough time um, during COVID-19. Um, I had a lot of patients who were reasonably independent. The ongoing physiotherapy or exercise programs or gym therapy had to stop. Uh, aqua, aqua aerobics, a lot of people use uh, swimming pools for uh, exercise, had to stop. Uh, and as a result of that, they deconditioned and they now are not independent. And the question is, will they become independent again? And I suspect some of them won't. So I think we're going to pay for the consequences uh, of uh, rehabilitation uh, services closing down. Right in the beginning of the pandemic, um, uh, prehabilitation became a really important issue. I didn't know about prehabilitation until I read an article uh, in the British Medical Journal around the issue uh, in relation to orthopedic surgery. This was about two years ago. And it became quite clear that during the pandemic, it was really age, uh, you know, 50 plus years of age uh, and comorbidities, particularly uh, lifestyle comorbidities, you know, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic lung disease uh, that was driving the high risk of mortality with COVID-19. And the issue wasn't different in MS. This is the French data just showing the same thing uh, in, in the MS population. Disability, old age, obesity, cardiac comorbidities, all were factors driving the mortality risk in our MS population who had got COVID-19. So I did a long, uh, post on our blog um, around how to prepare for getting COVID-19 and I made a point uh, that people needed to engage in prehabilitation. So this is optimizing your general well-being so that if you did get COVID-19, you would be better prepared for it. And I made the comment that this virus is never going to go away and probably become endemic. So you need to prepare for getting the infection at some stage. And there's no point telling patients in the MS community to do this without you doing it yourself. So I started to walk the talk and I started training. Um, I always was a runner, but I didn't do it that seriously as I got older. But I started training five, six times a week uh, and set myself a task of running a, uh, a virtual uh, marathon. Uh, I signed up to the New York Marathon, so I had to do it in a two-week window. But anyway, I lost 14 kilograms in weight. My BMI went down below uh, 25 for the first time in decades. I improved my sleep by at least two hours a night. My blood pressure normalized. I was borderline hypertensive prior to this prehabilitation program. My resting heart rate dropped uh, probably about eight beats per minute down to about 40 to 42. And sometimes now it uh, runs around 36 to 38. And I started religiously taking my vitamin D and zinc supplements as there was some evidence early on in the pandemic that these may reduce your risk of getting severe COVID. So um, I did walk the talk and as you can see on the 18th of October I ran a virtual marathon uh, around London uh, and uh, this is slightly longer than uh, on the marathon route but I managed to do a sub 320 marathon which is for me was I was very happy. The problem was literally three weeks later, I was out on a Saturday morning uh, running uh, and I was hit by a speeding motorcyclist going through an early red traffic light. Um, the reason why I was probably distracted, um, I was listening to, listening to this book by George Mombayo, a health economist, um, I mean an environmental economist, um, and it's a phenomenally good book about how we should be rewilding our open spaces. Um, anyway, I was using these uh, ear, earbuds that block out environmental sounds. So I couldn't hear anything. And that's possibly one of the reasons why I was hit by this uh, motorcycle. So there's another reason to not use these headphones or these uh, noise cancelling headphones. Subsequently to that, my uh, family bought me a pair of bone conducting ones, which I'd recommend.
anyway, I was seriously injured and I was taken to a major trauma center um, at King's College and I was pretty impressed how they looked after me. I went into the so-called trauma pr protocol. There was a single decision maker, standardized care pathway. I was stabilized. My pain was managed literally within five minutes. All my investigations and management were pre-planned. And uh, uh, my care plan actually inc included acute in-hospital rehab. I saw the rehab team literally the same day I was admitted, the physiotherapist and the occupational therapist. I was absolutely bowled over by the impact a care pathway can have on you. Anyway, I had a lot of injuries. I had a shattered pelvis that needed to be pinned. I had a fractured um, burst fracture of my C7 spine with a lateral dis displacement. As a result, I had a C7, C8 radiculopathy. Then I had a mild head injury and multiple soft tissue contusions. Anyway, I had to spend about uh, 10 hours in surgery to have my pelvis and my neck fixed. And then the long haul uh, started. Um, this showed you how vulnerable the NHS was because when I was uh, discharged from hospital, um, I was meant to go to a, you know, a, an acute rehab unit. But because I had an infected wound on my leg and I had a raised CRP, C-reactive protein, they wouldn't take me. So I lost my place. And so when it came to discharge, I didn't have a place to go to. So I went home. I must thank the physios and OTs because their job was to make sure I was a safe discharge. So I had to convince them that I could get to the toilet on my own, shower on my own, well, at least have um, some help with showering, and I could manage flights of stairs as I have a terraced house and I have to go upstairs to the, to, to the bedroom. And uh, the question they didn't really ask is if I had, to fall, if I had fallen, uh, I probably would not have been able to pick myself up. But anyway, I was discharged home and uh, told to uh, contact the local rehab team. Uh, well, the local rehab team literally could only see me um, roughly 12 or 13 weeks time. That was the first appointment I, I could have. So um, I managed to organize myself and you know, buy various equipment and I started a, a DOI rehab program. Well, a good colleague of mine, Dr. Rachel Farrell, who works at the National Hospital, said to me, Gavin, you really do need some professional input. You can't design your own rehab program. And the reason why I needed a rehab program, because I had quite a lot of weakness in my left arm. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I just generally had deconditioned quite rapidly. I'd lost a lot of weight even in hospital. And I felt weak. Anyway, she managed to get me, uh, a colleague of hers, a really, really super specialized neurophysiotherapist who had gone into the, uh, the private sector and I managed to employ her in the sense that she came to my house for an assessment and then she would come once a week and she gave me an amazing uh, rehab program. Um, and I begin to realize there is no real substitute for face-to-face -face rehab. Um, I found it very time consuming. She gave me about three to four hours of activities a day, which I had to do in two or three sessions. But I soon realized that the fact that it was goal driven uh, and I had I'd become quite self motivated. I really worked very very hard at it, and uh, I can say without her, um, I don't think I would have rehabbed nearly as well on my own uh, without the specialist input. So that was me hacking the community, and I must be grateful that I could afford to hire a private neurorehabilitation expert. Um, I don't know what would have happened to me if I had gone the traditional NHS route, discharged home to do whatever for the for 12 to 13 weeks before getting plugged in. Uh, I mean, I was really developing quite severe clawing of the hand by the time I uh, got to see her. And, uh, you know, some of the exercises she was giving, she gave to me really, really helped and my upper limb uh, function. Anyway, you're probably aware there is this push by the uh, NHS or other healthcare systems to uh, reconfigure uh, rehabilitation with a lot of it going online, which I'm a little bit skeptical of. But anyway, you should look at the uh, NHS Right Care uh, Rehabilitation Toolkits to get an idea of what is planned for rehabilitation in the UK at least. I must point out that motivation is really, really uh, critical. And one of the things that I... Uh, that led me to start running a marathon was that we were raising money for a research project to look at um, seroconversion rates, um, pre and post vaccination in people with multiple sclerosis through the coronavirus. 
um, which is why I um, um, set up various fundraising initiatives. My first one there on the top left is uh, my my marathon. When he raised fifteen thousand pounds running the marathon, after my accident, I set myself a bed to five k challenge before Christmas. Then, literally on the twenty fourth of December, I walked five kilometers. And there's my colleague Ruth Dobbs, Rod Ruth Dobbs, in there. One of my MS, one some, somebody who follows me on social media who lives in Cornwall, Kit, uh, decided to do a ten Cornish beach swim to raise money uh, from her friends. And I had some uh, high high worth uh, donors who contacted me independently of the uh, uh, online fundraising, and we raised about fifty five thousand uh, pounds. So there are some advantages to getting knocked over and fracturing your pelvis and cervical spine. Anyway, the money for this was to set up a new study, which Dr. Dobson ran, and this was basically to do seroconversion studies uh, remotely, and we showed that people on anti-CD20 and fingolimod don't seroconvert very well post-vaccination. The other thing was I had to reconfigure my life. I can't run anymore. My hip's too painful from my pelvis. And this is just showing you what rehabilitation does. So my first attempt on my wife's exercise bike, a Peloton, I managed to do 0.3 miles, okay? Well, literally a year later, uh, on the Sunday the 7th, which is the day, the, the anniversary of my accident, I managed to pump out uh, 26 uh, miles um, at about, which is about uh, just over an hour, which is about 40 kilometers per hour with uh, an average uh, power output of 300 watts. So if you know anything about running, you'd be pretty impressed with my uh, recovery. And I think the... Uh, um, Advantage is uh, knowing the power of rehabilitation to get you back. And I'm almost back to normal now. Apart from not being able to run, I am fully functional and independent. Anyway, I just always had this uh, map of MS management with MS-specific targets and non-MS-specific targets. And I had to redesign this now. And I want to put in two aspects, that rehabilitation has to be center stage now in terms of treating multiple sclerosis, as well as prehabilitation. You know, we have a responsibility to uh, implement preventive health care to optimize uh, MS outcomes. And those non-MS uh, brain health targets are the types of things we should be doing in the general population anyway. Also, we should not expect people uh, with multiple sclerosis to cut recover function uh, without rehabilitation, in other words, using exercise as a stimulus. So to conclude then, um, uh, one of my favorite books during the pandemic was this bedtime story, The Boy, the Mole, and the Fox, and the Horse by Charlie Mackesy. This was a Sunday Times bestseller list. Uh, it's basically bedtime philosophy. And the uh, in this particular scene, the boy is asking the horse, what's the best thing you've learned about storms? At the end, said the horse. And uh, fortunately, I predict COVID-19 will end. Also want to say to you that like any crisis, there's opportunities. And so it's up to you to think about what to do uh, in terms of how we're going to go forward post COVID-19 to uh, improve rehabilitation services and how we manage people with multiple sclerosis with, an, with, an, with the aim of maximizing their lifelong uh, brain health and outcomes. And if you're really interested in my thoughts on this, I would suggest you go on to my Medium site and uh, read my post on rethinking healthcare, about how we need to challenge the Victorian model uh, of healthcare. And to put it simply, the NHS is simply not ready nor configured for the efficient implementation of preventive medicine for aiding people to self-manage their, their own chronic diseases. And I give you some of my thoughts about how we should go forward. So thank you. I will take questions.